Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Edison Open House Healthcare event for 2022. And this is the Healthcare Equity Financing Panel. My name is Chris Mayo. I am Head of Primary Markets for the Americas at the London Stock Exchange Group. I get companies from the US and the rest of the Americas in the healthcare space and other sectors to IPO in London. Uh, we had five such companies do that from the Americas last year, which um, we'll talk about a little bit later in this panel. We have a really exciting panel of participants today who are all experts in their own way across the private and public financing elements of the healthcare sector. So I'd like to get my panelists to introduce themselves. And if I could start first, please, with Randy Barron. Yeah, so my name is uh, Randy Barron. I am a portfolio manager at a firm uh, called Pinnacle Associates. We are long-only managers, meaning no shorting, no derivatives, no hedging. We just pick stocks. And um, I guess for the purposes of this panel, although we're generalists, we have a healthcare bent. And the two notable kind of claims of fame in the sector are as a firm, our initial cost in Regeneron is below $5 a share. And um, we were more recently the first U.S. investor in Renalytics which I believe, Chris, is still the most successful life science IPO on the AIM market in the last couple of years. Yeah, um, it's, we'll, we'll talk a bit, a little bit more about that one later as well. Shahram, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Thank you very much. Yes, Chris, and thanks for having me on this panel. Uh, I'm Shahram Sayyidin Noor. I'm the founder and general partner of Civilization Ventures, a San Francisco Bay Area-based venture capital firm that's focused on healthcare and life sciences. Uh, we focus on three main verticals, genomics and diagnostics, synthetic biology, and digital health. Prior to starting Civilization Ventures, I had a career as an entrepreneur in the life sciences space. First company I was an executive in was acquired by Illumina as their software kind of multi-omics platform. And my second company, Inspirna, is now in phase two trials in the U.S. for oncology. Uh, claims to fame uh, for our uh, fund, Civilization Ventures, is that we were uh, early investors in Rocket Pharma, Gene and Cell Therapy Company that's now listed on NASDAQ, as well as in Lemonade Health, a digital health telemedicine company that was just acquired by 23andMe late last year. And very excited to uh, be speaking with you today because we just announced that Dr. Sandra Horning, former Chief Medical Officer of Roche, as well as a board member of Moderna and Gilead, joined the SAB Scientific Advisory Board of a company called Foresight Diagnostics out of Stanford that I'm on the board of and led the financing for. So great to, great to join you. Thanks. Um, Tom, would you like to finish us off? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Tom Stockman. So <clears throat> I uh, run the healthcare team for RBC uh, in, in Europe. I'm an investment banker, been in the industry for, um, for about 20 years and have uh, experience across capital markets, both uh, in Europe, the UK and the US, listing companies and raising money for them. Uh, domestically and in transatlantic deals. Good to meet you all. Thanks, thanks to you all for joining the panel. Um, I think it's a really interesting moment to discuss equity financing in the in the healthcare sector. And I'd really like to start start with talking about biotech IPO performance in the US over the last two years. We've seen a glut of biotech IPOs in the US. Unfortunately, performance has been pretty poor across the board. Um, and so I'd like to ask Tom in the first instance, do you think the biotech IPO window is still open in the US and what do you need to succeed as a company for seeking to tap the public markets, um, you know, from a profile of company and structure of deal? Um, perhaps you could give us your thoughts, Tom. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the markets have been really challenging uh, uh, over the last few months. Um, and we have seen fewer and fewer IPOs, and, and those IPOs that have come out, uh, the performance has been has been pretty poor, um, which which has created um, a very negative backdrop uh, as we look forward. Um, there have been a small number of IPOs so far this year, um, uh, but they too have, have have traded down, and I think you know we are we are seeing a little bit of a uh, people pausing for breath and a hiatus in the in the capital raising environment. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we 
don't think that this is going to last forever. I think we are, um, we do feel that there will be an IPO market during the course of 2022. And as a house, we continue to um, advise companies to look at uh, the, the, the US capital markets as a, as a, as a potential um, listing venue. However, I do think that there's, a, uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, uh, selectivity among investors. I think the flow of business is likely to be somewhat slower. Um, what is going to be IPOable? Um, uh, it goes without saying, it's going to be a flight to quality. Um, I think we're, we're expecting to see the, bit, the companies that are going public to be um, uh, uh, generally considered to be the, 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 the top end uh, in terms of the quality. What does that mean? It doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, uh, that it is uh, later stage or, or de-risked. Um, perhaps it means more that, that the technology is truly differentiated, that there is, um, that there is good data around it, um, that there is real differentiation, uh, but also that there is strong support from core investors, blue chip investors, well-recognized life sciences investors. So I think um, uh, we, we, we will see IPO activity in the US. I don't think the volumes are going to be the same as they have been in, the, uh, in, in recent years. Um, uh, but I, I, I think the key is going to be uh, assets that can demonstrate and convince the wider capital markets that, uh, that they have um, really high quality and, and, and unique assets. Thanks, um, Sharam. I'll be interested in your perspective here because obviously, as a VC, you've, you're looking for exits and returns. You know, what's your view on the kind of feedback loop from the public markets into the private markets? And also, I would be interested in your views generally on public markets valuations in the, in, certainly in the, uh, in the biopharma space. Great question. Uh, and, I, and I echo the statements that were just made by Tom. I, I think I look at it through two prisms. One is, do Will good companies that have important innovations that need funding be able to access appropriate capital? And of course, the public markets are one avenue for that. I would argue that what we're seeing in the public markets in biotech is just a part of a, the cyclical nature of that industry. If anything, over the last 24 months, we probably had too many companies arguably going public that lacked data, uh, many of them preclinical. So the fact that Gravity is taking hold, and these companies are now, you know, reestablishing, recalibrating their valuations. Is not really a bad thing. Uh, the question is, does that have implications for funding for quality companies? And I think the answer is no. There is uh, an unprecedented amount of capital in the private and public markets, um, obviously due to interest rates and other macro factors. But we see no shortage of follow-on capital for our startups. On the contrary, despite the deflation in public markets, there's still so much capital coming into the private markets that I think there's significant overvaluation uh, in, in much of the market. Uh, to the second part of your question, will this impact exits? The answer there is also no, uh, at least not in our portfolio. While it's true that early access, you know, preclinical access uh, to public markets is a positive for many companies and achieving liquidity for their shareholders, uh, accessing capital perhaps more cheaply, the mainstay of, of liquidity for biotech has pretty much always been M&A, and M&A is very, very strong. We, we will be announcing a big acquisition in our portfolio in the next two weeks, and there's just no shortage uh, of appetite by big and small biotech and pharmas that want to bring innovation into their platforms through an acquisition. And uh, it's, it's a very acquisitive industry. It'll remain so. I don't think things will slow down. Well, actually, I think you, you kind of run on to the next topic. If the IPO market is somewhat more subdued in comparison to previous years, I think the question for Tom would be, you know, and, and Shaham has, has already kind of hit on this point, where do you see M&A and also licensing coming in in terms of bridging the gap that the public markets perhaps is going to have a little bit less activity from an IPO perspective? What do you, what's your perspective, Tom? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I... I, I sorry. The um, M&A becomes, uh, or business development becomes a, a crucial source of financing. Um, uh, uh, so so I, I think that you, you have to look at those two topics slightly separately. But, you know, with valuations, with stocks down and valuations having come in, you know, you might expect to see uh, a rise in, in uh, M&A takeout of, of public companies. Um, I, I think that, 
that tends to take quite a long time to build into the system uh, for people's mindsets and expectations to, to change. Um, you know, I, I think that the appetite for M&A is there. A lot of the, on the buy side, um, the, 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 the desire to bring in uh, innovation, to bring in new products and to, to improve portfolios and growth amongst the, 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 the buyer universe is, is very much there. Um, uh, so I think the, the, the desire to do M&A and the drivers and the financing of M&A are, 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 are all in place. I think the valuation uh, depression at the moment takes longer to translate into actionability of, 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 uh, on the, on the sell, sell side. Um, but what it also means is that clearly raising capital at depressed valuations is unattractive. Um, so many of the companies who, who, uh, whose stocks have come off a lot, uh, whilst they may not initially entertain M&A uh, as a priority, they will be looking to, um, to business development deals as a way to continue to fund themselves in a, in a less expensive way than the cap markets. Um, I think we're going to start seeing a, a rise in re people looking for regional rights um, and to, to, uh, to license out you know, products from within their portfolio collaboration. So I, I think from a business development activity standpoint, um, you know, the, the underperformance of the cap market definitely will be a trigger for, for more activity on the BD front. Right. And obviously I focused on biopharma at the start of this panel, but I suppose, Tom, I'm just interested in your views. Um, and we'll go to UK and Europe next, but I think from a US perspective, interested in your other areas of life sciences like devices, diagnostics and tools. What's your view about how they may do from a public market perspective this year? Yeah, I, I think you know, we, we've definitely seen um, uh, an increase in uh, med tech IPOs and, and growth med tech um, uh, through 2021, and I think that perhaps some of those assets are, are slightly lower risk or perceived to, to be less binary, and so therefore, um, uh, I think we think they will be a bit more insulated from the, the current downturn. Um, I think also there are there are services businesses um, uh, uh, and uh, really ac across the, pro the 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 support of the um, the wider healthcare mainstream healthcare sector that are also very definitely looking towards IPO. So I think there will be um, less of an impact outside biopharma. I think we'll continue to see volumes coming in, in those other healthcare segments, uh, independent of uh, some of the noise in the, uh, in, in, in the biopharma space at the moment. And Chris, so, uh, this is Randy. If I could just jump in here for a second. Um, both Tom and, and Sharam have commented on the downturn. I thought it'd be useful, especially for some of your viewers like me who are generalists who maybe don't appreciate the magnitude of what's been happening in this market. So uh, again, I approach it from the public perspective. And so just looking at the XBI, which is the S&P Biotech ETF, started trading in February 2006. There's been eight peak to trough declines in that period, averaging 35% over about 140 days. Uh, obviously, the market bottomed in December has gotten worse. In 22, we are well over a 40% decline uh, currently for that S&P Biotech ETF uh, as of this recording. And when you look at the flip side of it, saying kind of buying low and, and seeing where it runs, um, typically, the last one was in 2016, there was a 50% decline. The return thereafter over the next 800 days was about 130%. So there's a reason a lot of people are looking at this now and saying, hey, you know, can we, can we separate the wheat from the chaff? Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And that's why I like to go to talk about UK and Europe, because obviously the, the US, the, what's happened in the US is very different. I mean, obviously the composition of the market is completely different. Um, so just actually, I may as well go to you, Randy, and get your thoughts on this. You know, um, I'll get my personal plug in that we had five North American life sciences businesses go public um, on AIM, which is the London Exchange growth market last year. Um, we also had a very successful IPO in Oxford Nanopool, uh, which is obviously in the wider life sciences space. And there've been other IPOs as well. So I guess the, the question I've got for you as, a, as someone who invests internationally is what's your view of what's been going with those kind of IPOs 
uh, in London. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Remolytics earlier. What's, you know, what's your view about how the kind of UK and Europe is different than the US in this regard? So, um, as you mentioned, we're kind of a known entity, especially in the UK. Uh, while we do invest globally and we have healthcare names in Germany and Australia and the Canada, most of ours are UK based. And so we do a lot of what they call TTWs, testing the water meetings for a lot of these increasingly US companies that are looking to list abroad. Uh, there's a host of reasons why you'd want to do that, not the least of which is if you can access the capital markets anywhere and kind of be accountable and prove that you can deliver, uh, to Sean's point, whether you're preclinical or not, that tends to build goodwill over time and, and certainly gives management teams an opportunity to really monetize kind of all this work that they're doing. Uh, we are not seeing a real slowdown in um, overall. I mean, Sharam, you mentioned your second vertical is synthetic biology. That's a space that we know pretty well. I think the ginkgo, you know, DNA listing in the US probably was detrimental, at least in the medium term, for a lot of Symbio companies that are looking to access the public markets right now. That stock for your for your viewers basically was a $15 stock that I think today as we're recording is going to dip under five. So, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in the space. Uh, the capacity of London AIM to be an avenue of exit or at least initial exit for a lot of these companies, I think is something that's really interesting. And it hasn't really made it bubbled up to a lot of the radar screens of a lot of people in my seat, kind of public market equities in the US. And I think increasingly you're gonna see it. And Tom, I guess, you know, I'd ask you a similar question. You're head of European healthcare, not obviously not UK healthcare, but obviously for investment banking. What's your view of how the UK and European markets are viewing, um, you know, life science businesses and what the receptivity is like. Yeah, look, I think you mentioned um, Oxford Nanopore as a, you know, a, a, an example of a company that came to the, the UK market um, uh, and performed extremely well, um, got a, a huge amount of demand and interest. And, and I think that that, uh, that type of company, there, there aren't loads of them. Um, but companies that, that have that kind of profile uh, that have been well capitalized um, really capture and, and have good good comps and, and, and a good uh, a clear story have um, uh, really captured the imagination of the, of, of, of the market and uh, you know, clearly that was that was a very successful IPO that we were one of the book runners on um, uh, equally you know I think there are some subsectors that are that have been performing well I think um uh if you look at some of the uh, uh, uh pharma service providers um uh the cdmo space i think you've, you've had some uh, some 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 good performance from uh some companies that have exposure to the broader healthcare sector but aren't necessarily as binary as some of the biopharma stories um those have uh had a lot of traction across across europe but in different indices in europe and uh, you know, I, I think there is a there's a backlog of um, IPOs with that uh, type of profile. So I think um, you know we're pretty excited about the prospects for the European capital market. Um, I think you may see uh, a little bit more of a focus on larger, um, uh, more commercially developed um, companies coming to market than uh, than the pure biotech. Um, but I think broadly, you know, investor interest in the healthcare space remains quite high. Um, uh, and, and I think there is going to continue to be uh, a, a slew of, of uh, IPOs in, in, in the European exchanges, um, albeit not necessarily uh, uh, slightly de-risked stories. Right. And Sharam, I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, obviously you've got, you know, a limited amount of capital that you have to put to play. Do you consider opportunities outside of the US? Do you look at UK and Europe for those kind of opportunities? Or are you solely focused or is it too much for you to do in the US alone? And so you haven't got time to look at outside of the US? Well, I definitely feel like there's too much to do. <laughs> we, we are, uh, we, <laughs> up. we, we uh, try to keep up uh, with the, the flow of information and the, the funnel of companies that we analyze. We do have investments outside of the US. We have um, a company called Aspect Bio doing 3D bioprinting in Canada. We have a company in Brazil called Clevo doing uh, chronic condition management via telemedicine. We have two companies in England, one called Oxscan using artificial intelligence for early okay. cancer detection. 
and another called Evonetics, doing uh, DNA synthesis using a desktop printer. We had a company out of Holland called Tiga TX, working on IgA antibodies. So we actually do uh, invest outside of the U.S. as well. Um, we have a fellowship program with PhDs from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, um, Stanford, Berkeley, all the top schools as well. So we're global in that sense. The only thing we try to be careful of is not to invest in jurisdictions that are difficult for corporate development, that are where it's difficult to you know downsize or upsize as you need to. There are some ju jurisdictions that I won't name in Europe where they make it especially hard for businesses, and those could really hamper an early startup. But innovation is global, as you guys all know. You know some of the leading uh, inventions and innovations in the world come from places like Cambridge and Oxford, including Selexa, which is the basis of much of Illumina's current innovation and the DNA sequencing revolution uh, after the acquisition by Illumina. So we try to keep a very open mind and aperture, so long as our our team and uh, time allows us. I think probably the constraint is language barriers, maybe uh, jurisdictional barriers with legal regimes and our time. Yeah, understood. Um, so I wanted to go to Randy next. Um, and this is part of like the kind of where the investment dollars should go going forward. Um, you're an internationally focused fund manager. You know, you don't have to invest in healthcare, but you do extensively. Um, you know, how do you choose which subject, subsectors of healthcare to invest in? You know, what, what's most attractive to you right now, Randy? Uh, and, and, you know, what, what's the drivers behind those things? I'm chuckling to myself, Chris, because it probably um, reflects more on me and my personality that I really lo I love broken things. I really do. I, I learned early on, I think this is the 25th year of my career, early on that inefficiencies are where you make money, right? I, I don't want to compete against the Goldman Sachs, you know, 12 analyst team that's knocking the doors and doing all the kind of KOL meetings, because it's just not where I'm going to bring added value. Yeah. Um, my, where I'm looking right now, I'm looking a lot at medical device companies. I mean, medical device is something uh, where the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater across the board. And there has been no nuance from the market at all when it comes to individual companies. So I'm actually of the opinion, and I know this is kind of anathema to what the market is saying, that we are about to enter the dawn of a new day where active management is really going to take off. In other words, individual stock picking, the kind of stuff that Charm does individually, the kind of stuff that we're doing uh, globally, it's, it's going to matter more and more. And so the passive funds where you just say, okay, here's a bucket in this case of diagnostic companies, you know, it's not going to matter as much. So that's where we're spending a lot of our time. And um, Shahram, you you know you ha you invest across the board. You you just gave us a really interesting list of the the various investments that you have. Um, you know you invest in therapeutics. You're investing in digital health. Where do you think the most interesting areas are going to be? Do you think the pandemic has changed the situation or accelerated changes significantly? And where where do you think you're going to put your dollars going forward? Well, first of all, I agree with everything Randy just said. Uh, it's really about the companies, not the sectors. Uh, sectors go up and down with the tide, but it's individual performers and, frankly, individual technologies and their differentiation, which will make all the difference. Uh, I think, I, so just to echo what Randy said, I believe that we are entering a new dawn of uh, personalized medicine, and that encompasses a host of diagnostic tools, both companion diagnostics for personalization of things like cancer treatment, as well as the quantified self-movement where you can kind of diagnose your current condition, the state of your metabolism, the state of your cancer risk through screening, really on a weekly basis if you choose to. Some of these devices will, will even in the next 10 to 20 years be at-home devices. Some will use uh, saliva, maybe other media that will be protein-based, that will be DNA-based, all kinds of convergences occurring in the sector. I also, that's on the diagnostics, personalized medicine front. I think that with respect to therapeutics, we also, uh, Randy mentioned he doesn't like to go up against the, you know, the army at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I empathize with that. We try to be very lean and uh, differentiated in how we approach our market. And so we focus on, not on traditional small and large molecule therapeutics, for example, but rather on modalities where we might have an edge. And that includes things like gene editing, uh, some of the newer technologies, kind of CRISPR 2.0, CRISPR 3.0, things like base editing, prime editing are coming out of universities. Oftentimes PhDs are, you know, the, the inventors of this technology. 
and they want to run their own company. So they're not going to let flagship give them 3% of the company to run it. They're going to basically want to be the founders more on the Google model. And that's where we also gravitate and that founder centric model to support the most cutting edge innovations in things like gene and cell therapies that I think will be increasingly taking a portion of therapeutics. You know, we, we went from small molecules to antibodies becoming more prominent today to now, I think, curative treatments, uh, both cell therapies as well as gene editing technologies that can eventually be used in vivo to cure diseases. I think that's where the puck is moving over the next 10 years. It's going to be risky. There will be many failed clinical trials. Stocks will come, go up and come down. But I think you'll see five to 10 companies emerge beyond the current leaders like Editas and Intelia and CRISPR. You'll see others also emerge that will be 40, 50 billion, 100 billion dollar companies. Uh, and that's what we hope to play. And, and there's two things, Chris, to what Sharm just said that I think just on a macro level matter. One is this is a space where narratives matter, right? And especially yeah. after the meme stock era, think about what he's talking about. CRISPR 2.0, like all of this evolution that we're doing, you're going to be capturing live cancer cells, which we've never done. That's Angle PLC on the UK. Um, I think the other thing that's relevant to that is in its nature, this is all socially responsible investing in the sense that we're not losing sleep at night saying, you know, are we investing in private prisons where they're doing bad things that we don't know what happens in the dark night and probably we don't want to know, right? Everyone on this panel is working towards creating a better world for the next generation and health lives. And I think that resonates with a lot of investors, both private and public. That's good. No, it's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. You know, we talk about ESG a lot, and obviously this sector should be one which has both an economics and social benefit um, to us all. And I don't think it's really really classified that way, and perhaps it should be, um, you know, as being a core holding. Whereas you consider in a lot of ESG portfolios, the core holdings are people like Google and Microsoft. That you know, cloud computing companies has been has seen a lot of. Ben, and that's a whole different that. conversation because you know, know. S&P and Moody's correlate one-to-one. -one. There's 300 different ESG rating services. The correlation is mm. 0.2. There's no correlation because you may choose to focus on, and by the way, for your listeners, ESG, environmental, social governance, you may choose yeah. to focus yeah. on water. Uh, Sharam may focus on diversity in the boardroom. We all have different things and that makes sense. And so when you look at kind of the famous list, like the Barron's top 100 ESG list, like why is Tiffany's on that list in the top five? because they don't use blood diamonds, that's anathema, right? And that's exactly the opposite of what we're talking about here, where we're creating something. And I should this also point out over time. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I should also point out that LECG, the London Stock Exchange Group, owns both Flutzy Russell and Affinity, which are big uh, providers of ESG-related data and information services. There's another plug for you. Actually, I wanted to go into uh, another kind of subsector, if you will, which I think is close to your your heart. Actually, both Sharam and and Randy have mentioned this. You know, what do you think is the, the uh, kind of outlook for synthetic biology, uh, Randy? Because I know you spent a lot of time looking at this, so I'll let you talk about that for a little bit. I know I, you, I'm really, I'm actually really to curious to hear Sharam. I'm really curious to hear Sharam's take on it. Um, so I, for good or for ill, and currently for ill, I wrote the Barron's Investor's Guide 101 to Synthetic Biology. When you look at the worst performing recommendations that they made last year, the literal worst list, the number like 150, was Amaris, which is the largest player in the space. It's an Emeryville-based uh, company. You know, fundamentally, when you look at synthetic biology and what it is, and, and it's a really fancy term for just accelerated biology, you have to ask the question of what is harder to design? Just, just thematically. Is it you know, the, the Apple phone that we all carry or is it an Apple seed that gets planted in the ground that becomes a tree that then grows a branch that then creates a fruit, right? And the concept of if we can apply some of this to clean chemistry, to engineering, I mean, it, it certainly feels like a revolution, but I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague here and hear what what his take on it is. Well, uh, thank you, Randy. Synthetic biology is a moniker that's been used now for decades. I mean, I would argue the first synthetic biology company was Genentech with recombinant DNA technology. That, that level of manipulation of biology, I think, would qualify for the word synthetic. Today, as Randy has indicated, it's been accelerated and the term has become more prominent to describe a new category of companies that are using things like artificial intelligence in the case of 
Zymergen, and Ginkgo, uh, they're using uh, bigger bioreactors, more sophisticated gene editing technologies like CRISPR-based techniques to accelerate that. So for, just to give a few examples, we have a company in our portfolio out of MIT called Manus Bio uh, that actually bought the former NutraSweet factory uh, in, in Georgia, I believe, that's recapitulating terpenoid pathways in bacteria. So they're producing things like natural sweeteners or grapefruit extract using bacteria. Uh, we have a company, Anthea, started, by, started and run by a former Stanford professor, Christina Smolke, that's producing analgesics. These are uh, WHO, you know, world medicines uh, that are essential for human um, therapeutics, uh, and they're using yeast to produce these, which is basically, you know, bacteria was what Genentech used to produce insulin when it began its business. So that whole field is being accelerated. Those are two, you know, examples among thousands. Um, there are companies producing proteins, producing beef, producing chicken, every meat you can imagine, milk, etc., all under the umbrella of synthetic biology. So the movement of synthetic biology is very, very broad. It goes from food ingredients to medicines to things like leather and you know other things that you can produce using biology. I would recommend for all the viewers uh, here, listeners, the book Regenesis by George Church from Harvard, which does a really good job of describing the potential of this technology. And he goes into some esoteric things that are fun to read about, like left and right-handed molecules, which, you know, I won't even pretend to describe on this call. But uh, suffice it to say that it is also the dawn of a new era in biology. I think that what happened in the 1900s in the last century with respect to physics and electrical engineers being so prominent, and of course computer scientists, will happen in biology where fundamentally human evolution will change over the next 50 years and over the next 100 years will change even more, uh, where medicines will change, foods will change, just the way we live will completely change because of genetic engineering. And that really in a nutshell is the ultimate promise of synthetic biology. Uh, so the manifestation of that in today's world, and you know, for, for, for a, a humble investor like ourselves is to find the opportunities where that technology and the cutting edge of it can be applicable in the next five to 10 years in developing a drug for Huntington's or you know, producing grapefruit extract at a fraction of the price, uh, et cetera. So that's, that's, that's the difficulty. Um, Randy described Amherst. I was an angel investor in a company called Aurora Algae uh, 10 years ago out of Berkeley that raised a lot of money and eventually kind of did an asset sale to um, one of its investors. And, those biofuel companies that use algae, again, using genetic engineering to produce biofuels, just didn't survive because of fracking, gas, and oil prices falling. And I think the reality is that no matter how exciting or sexy this technology is, it has to compete in the real world based on the regulations we have today. And so one example would be the foods that are being produced using bioreactors, you know, mother's milk using a bioreactor versus her mother's to make it possible for women who can't produce milk when they're pregnant. Like, is that really going to be cost competitive? A little bit TBD. Uh, whether the contamination issues are worked out, the price can fall fast enough. In therapeutics, you don't have that problem because people pay a lot of money for curative therapies, even if it's a half million dollar treatment for you know, a few million cells to go into your body or, or payloads and AAVs that contain genetic material to cure you. That, that'll get reimbursed, that'll get acquired. So we try to be mindful as investors to invest in the future that we want but also do it in a way that's sustainable and where we see viability for those companies. And I'll stop there. I don't want to speak too much about this. Uh, <laughs> technology. Yeah. No, no, that, this is very interesting. I mean, Tom, I, I, you know, you may have no thoughts on synthetic biology, but I just thought, you know, at least give the opportunity to comment. Yeah, no, look, I mean, I think we, as we've, so many sort of uh, frontiers in, in in science and how it translates into building great companies and and, and developing great businesses. I think you know t making sure that companies stay at the forefront, uh, funding these types of companies in the capital markets or indeed the private markets. It's all um, uh, I think as was said about developing viable products. Um, you know science projects are are, are great and fascinating. But ultimately, they need to, um, to 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 translate into, you know, something that that uh, the, the 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 market needs, the healthcare system wants, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think it is uh, uh, fantastic that there are unicorns out there across all sorts of different verticals and subsectors 
um, that have been getting funded. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the concept of, of, of synthetic biology, but also many others um, in, this, in this environment, this financing environment, uh, uh, so much has been able to progress in, uh, in, in the private market initially and then come to the capital markets. Um, to get funded and get developed, that I think um, you know the, the 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 progress that has been made relative to um, uh, uh, several years ago when you know perhaps there was less funding for these types of companies um, uh, has come on leaps and bounds, and I and I, I really think that the, uh, the the pool of capital that's out there that's willing to support businesses like this, I think you know continue in any sector, but including uh, these kind of leading edge sectors. Um, is, 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 a, is a huge force for good and a, and a huge force for, for further innovation. So um, I'd like to talk about another capital markets issue, which was very, very prevalent in 2021, which is SPACs. So just for our, so, you know, this special purpose acquisition company for, for, for some of our viewers who may not be familiar with it. So in the US last year, SPACs were something like 63% of the deal count for IPOs and about 50% of the IPO volume. Um, so these are just you know, astonishing numbers relative to, to, if you think about the last decade. Do you think that SPACs have a role to play in the healthcare sector, especially if you think there's going to be more, you know, a more subdued IPO activity? Um, and I'll probably start with Randy, if I may. So um, SPACs have existed for a long time. They weren't called SPACs, they were called blank check companies. And I think uh, despite their lack of success, so Ginkgo, for example, which Ram and I just mentioned, DNA, the old Genentech symbol, um, you know, came, came public via the, actually the largest SPAC, I think of the year, $17.5 billion. Uh, any way you can access the capital markets that is sustainable, I think is totally fair play to me. I have no view on something. Something's not good or bad because it's a SPAC, right? It's the same way that we're not for or against management, we're for shareholders. So there's any way for a company to get capitalized and to execute its plan, perhaps even more seamlessly than it would be. So the, 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 the counterfactual question is, if they didn't go a SPAC, let's say they can't access the capital markets, what else are they gonna do? Typically they go to mezzanine financing or a venture firm. And you know, I talked to a lot of management teams that kind of pull their hair out because the board meetings for that process are real pain. You got a three-day meeting, you're sitting there once a quarter, you're getting kind of talked down to by, you know, quite frankly, a 20-something year old person who doesn't maybe know the business as well as you do. And that's really frustrating. Uh, now, mind you, the public markets can be frustrating too. And certainly like we talked about the whole sector, you know, being out of favor, it's it's really frustrating. But I, I'm I'm neither pro nor cons back. I'm pro kind of businesses moving forward in, in as accessible a way as possible. Right. So again, I, I'll, I'll post it to Shaharam because I'll be interested in his perspective. So you've got a company, they could do another private round or they could do, do a SPAC, they get a public listing, but you get 70% redemption as part of the DSPAC vote um, and you raise a pipe. Well, you know, what's your kind of perspective on that as a, you know, when you're looking at further financing but also liquidity events for, you, for the companies you've invest, invested in? Um, I think, Chris, on that question, I really would echo what Randy said. I think the devil with SPACs is in the details. Um, SPAC is just a means to an end, and, and it really does depend on the sophistication of the management and, and credibility of the team running the SPAC. I mean, just to give you some examples, um, as I mentioned, Lemonade Health, one of our portfolio companies, telemedicine leader here in the U.S. and actually in England as well now, was acquired by 23andMe. 23andMe just went public via SPAC. So that stock is down a little bit. You know, I'm sure it'll be up hopefully in the long term over the next five years. Uh, but was that a result of the SPAC? I mean, not really. If it had gone public through an IPO, it probably may also have the same volatility. Um, the difference, I think, is that with respect to SPACs, you have kind of a management team of the SPAC negotiating the price at which it executes. That might cause redemption issues, as you pointed out, Chris, and then they'll just do a pipe. Usually there's, there's so much money out there, they'll find a way to get it done. Um, I think with investment bankers taking companies public, there's probably more discipline with respect to kind of valuation out the gate. Of course, not always, as you see, a lot of IPOs also perform poorly. So maybe a six of one half dozen of the other. You know, at the end of the day, it's just a vehicle to go public. 
it, it does leave a bad taste in some people's mouths because lack of transparency generally vis-a-vis -vis IPOs. That's, I think, being rectified by the SEC. I think they recognize there are issues that need to be changed, that need to be regulated better. So as long as the regulations are even across SPAC versus IPO, it's just another avenue. It looks like the whole SPAC craze is now behind us anyway, uh, because you know what's, what's kind of the point if it's just as difficult? What people perceive as the advantages of SPACs don't seem to be many, really advantageous anymore. So I think that's kind of, as Randy said, it's been around a long time, the, change, the name changes, and it's kind of fizzing out. And you'll see good companies do SPACs. You'll see bad companies do SPACs. One of my friends just took um, Senti Bio public through uh, a SPAC that he runs. And I think that company will probably do very well. With very smart management. My friend is extremely intelligent. We took the company public via the SPAC. So um, I don't have a view on SPACs per se. It's more that the management team of the companies that are going yeah. But that point you just said is really important at the end, which is the SEC is getting more involved because the SPAC process, uh, people choose it in part because it's less onerous and it costs less. But the phrase I always say is anyone can make a PowerPoint. You know, you can give a five-year projection yeah. in your presentation, you're doing a SPAC, which the prospectus through the SEC would never allow. So there yeah. will be a reckoning that will happen. And then, by the way, it'll be the next acronym that all of us have to learn or whatever. It just continues. This is how capital markets work. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. I mean, there's a, there's a regulatory arbitrage that's been taken advantage of by lots of people there. But at the end of the day, there's more than 500 SPACs looking for acquisitions now. To your point, there's some really good companies. Are there 500 companies suitable to be listed? I probably doubt that's the case. <laughs> Unfortunately, that capital has to be used, and I think obviously you're going to get some bad allocation decisions as a result of that. And I think that's the view. You know, SPACs by themselves aren't aren't, aren't bad. They, you know, it really boils down to the quality of the asset and management team that is looking to go public. Um, but I think you know when you've had that amount of money go into one one area, you're likely to end up with some suboptimal outcomes. And Tom, if you have any any perspectives on it. Uh, it might. I mean, I, I agree with everything that's been said here. It, it really comes down to the, the underlying businesses that get invested in. And when you've got such a huge amount of capital trapped on a, quite a, a tight timeline, um, you know, the, the decisions that are made will maybe not all be brilliant. But, but ultimately, you know, if you look at um, uh, the, the reverse uh, uh, merger into to, to fallen angels um, uh, that, that have been quite um, popular over the last few years amongst biotech companies at different times when the markets were uh, were more challenging. I think you see a similar similar picture of um, you know, some, some great successes, some 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 real success stories, um, but also quite a few that, that that didn't make it. And if you look at any class, uh, uh, the IPO class, you, you will ultimately uh, could make the same conclusion with the benefits yeah. of, uh, of of time. So I, I think for um, uh, to the extent that it allows companies to access capital when uh, the capital markets are are more challenging as they are at the moment, I think it's um, it's 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 a, it's a great source of uh, of funding. Um, but there will be some winners and losers as, as with everything. So no, I, I think um, uh, uh, I, I truly agree with everything that's been said. Great. Well, I just think we're about to wrap up now. I just I thought I'd give you guys, if any of you, uh, you know, want to add any final comments, I'm happy to hear them, obviously, before I do the wrap up. So is there anything that burning that you guys want, would like to say before we, we finish? I just want to thank you for inviting me to the panel and I really enjoyed my colleagues on the panel. So thank you very much. I, I, I echo those themes and I will even go on a limb and say, you know, we're recording this in January of 2022. Um, I really believe by the end of this calendar year, that XBI that I started talking about kind of just how the sectors yeah. is going to be up relative to today. Yeah. And I would, I would just say that from my point of view, um, you know these market corrections uh, do happen, but but I'm I think we're we're optimistic that there is going to be a rebound. Um, it may not be that dramatic or rapid a rebound, but that uh, that the capital markets there will be windows, deals will be happening, and whether it is SPAC deals, uh, follow-ons, pipes, or, uh, or or straight IPOs, I think um, as anybody looking at this from the point of view of accessing the capital markets in Europe or the US. You know, I, I think you should uh, you should you should anticipate that there will be there will be more deal flow and more opportunity. So uh, I think we're all we all stand ready to uh, 
to, as investors and advisors to uh, to be to work with, with with companies. Great. Well, thank you all. I mean, I'm I'm personally pleased that I didn't say 2021 when I meant to say 2022, which I've been doing throughout this week. So that that at least is a small triumph for me. And also, I obviously, from my perspective, I hope to see more North American life sciences companies going public in in london throughout uh, 2022 so that's obviously my personal goal for this year so it just um you know remains for me to say thank you to the participants in this panel thanks to randy thanks to sharon thanks to tom it's been a really great panel i hope that you that you the audience watching really get something out of this but also get something out of the rest of the edison open house healthcare events and that uh, we see you in subsequent events as well. So it just leads me to say thank you very much for watching and goodbye.